All right, folks, we, we can move on to our next speaker. So I'm going to be inviting on the stage Martin Burr. Let's see if we can have it right here right now. Hello, hello. Hello, Martin. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. Where are you connecting with us from? Uh, New Zealand today. All right. What time is it down there? 9 a.m. Got a coffee already? Or oh, yeah. I've had the coffee, had the breakfast. Kids are off to school. Ready to roll. All right. Then I think we're all set here. OK. Today, Martin is going to be talking with us um, about uh, GraphQL-based integration middleware and how we can use that to kick off and, and um, an architecture for an ecosystem. So without further ado, I'm going to be leaving the stage. Martin, take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Martin, CEO, co-founder of Tech Technologies. We are a full lifecycle API management vendor, Flapim, as the previous uh, speaker told everyone. Uh, I'm coming to you live today from a slightly wintry New Zealand. And today, I'd like to talk about GraphQL. Uh, it's a technology I've long, long been a skeptic of, but I've finally seen the light. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you about why we believe that the future is a graph. Before we start, let's talk about a few home truths about complex systems. Uh, a system's complexity will grow as the size of the organization grows. Two, well-sized, smaller systems are easier to manage than massive monoliths. And three, the modern organization is not just the software they build, but the software that they use. The reason I want to lay these out is because they reflect the reality that, a, that software is all around us. And that software is delivered as an API, not just to consumers like apps and sites, but as a full-blown architectural pattern. And you know where this is going, right? Microservices. That's right. Well, let's use a better term, actually. Well-sized services. I don't want to get into a debate here about how big or small the domain of a service should be. Just agree that the underlying principle that smaller, well-defined units are easier to manage than large, singular ones. Now, you could say, and I often have, that a well-built monolith that takes its solid principles seriously and tries to operate a dry development ethos is essentially in the same boat as a big microservice application. And you'd be correct, to a point. For one, the fact that using a monorepo for microservices stack is a popular decision is telling, but there's a bit more to it. That's because microservice architectures are most beneficial to the ops and software development lifecycle teams needing to coordinate releases and to manage cost of scale. It's a layer above the build itself where they really shine. So inevitably, breaking up a monolith does, does make sense for larger organizations. Of course, the other benefit is speed to market. Making changes to a microservice is like hot swapping code. It's just a lot less cool, which is a good thing. The thing is, this is not the whole picture of an API first organization. Sorry, one second. Now, I don't want to wax lyrical about why microservices have come to be so dominant in the enterprise today. Instead, I'd like to talk about all the other services that inexorably become part of your service ecosystem without you asking for it. Here's a stat that will shed some light. The average organization will have up to 137 different SaaS applications that they use to operate the business. We're talking CRM, identity, stock management, e-commerce, newsletters, human resources, recruitment, and advertising. And there's thousands more I haven't even mentioned yet. And it's extremely likely that you are constantly interacting with these APIs from these services. For example, getting a notification from Slack whenever a contact form has been submitted or when a sale's been completed. Each of these SaaS services that you buy a key service they should be offering is an API. And almost all of them do have one to some extent. The question is, do you really use them? Think about how much value is trapped inside the data silos that these applications aggregate. They store information from software interactions as well as human interactions. Their inputs are from your staff every day, all the time, data about the real world that can be categorized and filtered. Now, this isn't a new problem. Back in the 90s, you'd go buy an Oracle database and host it yourself, or you'd buy a SharePoint or WebSphere system and run that on dedicated hardware. Then along comes the cloud and poof, you migrate that out and save on hardware, but you're still dealing with this massive store of value. Just instead of an isolated silo, you now have these lovely APIs to interact with. Now, if you followed any trend, all of these older self-hosted, li 
hosted licensed solutions are moving to more profitable and agile pay-as-you-go solutions sitting in infrastructure you do not need to maintain or patch. And of course, you use them when you use them. We integrate with these silos all the time. It's one of the key drivers of the software industry, actually. How many people here have had to integrate with Stripe at some point or PayPal or Twilio? The thing is, those integrations are a bit messy. I mean, let's take a little look at that. This here is your typical integration picture. You will have a series of microservices that consume dependent external APIs, and those will be a point-to-point -point integration. There's nothing wrong with this approach, especially when looking at an outside-in perspective where the application stack consumes data and calls functions from these dependencies. The one thing worth mentioning here is that the more of your services interact with a dependency, the more risk you add. Of course, using solid principles, we can avoid that with the facade pattern. That's better. Now, we only need to update the facades if the vendor decides to give us grief with an unannounced upgrade or breaking change. We did add two more services now, though, and those services will have multiple dependents. So a single failure now affects multiple interlocked services. They are essentially entangled. It's a slightly different matter when you need the support system to speak to the CRM system as well. So, your, your brain might be hurting a little bit now, and it should, because this is how you get microservices bloat. I'm not going to go into great detail about service mesh. Suffice it to say that service mesh will not save you here. It just makes the diagram look cleaner. Under the hood, these are still point-to-point -point integrations with a mediator. So to get the CRM system to talk to the support system, we've had to do two things. We've had to build a new facade because the number of dependencies has gone above one. We have to write a and we have to write a connector service to normalize the data between the two systems. Now, we've got this customs connector we built. It might just be a Lambda function, but nonetheless, it's more crap we need to maintain. So to summarize, we needed to write multiple new services to properly abstract external dependencies. Should we wish to directly integrate two dependencies, we need to write a mediator service. All of this is somewhat mediated by a service mesh, but that also means that I now need to manage a service mesh, and my integrations are still point to point. If I wish to perform an integration with a dependency of another service, I need to integrate with the facade. And if the facade does not encompass the full functionality of the dependency, I need to modify the facade as well. And it's that last point that's probably the biggest issue. Ideally, when writing software and especially microservices, you will want to keep the functional footprint and therefore risk as small as possible. So you'll only ever build exactly what you need. This is not a bad approach. If you have the liberty of a homogenous, well-crafted, perfectly executed microservice service mesh, in reality, stacks are a whole lot more messy. Uh, there's a more traditional way to deal with this, and it's one that some organizations might find themselves in already, and one that, in theory, shouldn't require more code and potentially could solve the facade functionality problem, and that solution is called throw money at it. And it looks a little bit like this. In this scenario, someone like me comes along and tells you that you need to install an ETL system to normalize and combine all your data, wire it into a data warehousing platform that you can query with your BI software. You have that too, right? Uh, then to install an enterprise service bus because it can provide normalization connectors for the APIs of each of your dependency for a price, and then modify your microservices to account for the message-based development pattern needed to get all of this working your reaction might be something like this. All of a sudden, your complexity is tripled. You have new inputs, new outputs, and a new integration challenge that's meant to handle your existing integration challenge. All right, this is an extreme example. Of course, you don't need all of these things. You may only need one or two. Unfortunately, even just one of these solutions adds significant systems complexity, and you are so right. We deserve better. So ask yourself, surely I can do more with my microservices. It looks manageable, I think. Why add more layers of software coordination to connect stuff when I can just write a microservice and do it myself? What is a modern microservice addicted organization meant to do with their 137 SaaS applications that potentially enrich and store massive amounts of value and data about their operations? Before I scare you back to DIY, the answer, I believe, is not lash it all together with intermediate microservices, as tempting as it may be to scratch that short-term itch. As we've demonstrated, it's a great deal of work, and we still have the scope challenge to contend with to mitigate future integrations. It also means 
that you need to build an API observance team to keep up with any and all dependent changes with the upstream. That would suck, right? I mean, imagine having to maintain and manage someone else's API. I mean, who in their right mind would ever want to do API management for a living? So let's look at a different type paradigm. What if you could integrate your data as easily as a database table join? What if you had a data integration layer and never had to change your upstream services? What if, when you needed to integrate your CRM platform with your accounts microservice, you didn't need to write a new layer or make a point-to-point -point integration? What if you exchanged your message bus for an API bus? Well, this is a real quote from a user. <clears throat> We're connecting a WooCommerce, uh, WooCommerce shop, REST API with custom endpoints, to SAP by design SOAP. I want to look at, have a look at Tyke. Uh, data transformations work. That's a real quote from a user. If you are using microservices, you are very likely to be using an API gateway. So why not just do the integration there? As much as I would love everyone to use their API gateway to do integration, this is not the way. As soon as you do this, your API gateway becomes your new monolith. Why? You likely need to pack a bunch of business logic into the gateway. And that's a hidden complexity because the code and the logic is no longer directly part of your software cycle you may as well have written a bunch of intermediary services. Ultimately, you are also dealing with the raw APIs of your SaaS providers. So you're still doing point-to-point -point integrations and baking vendor logic and potentially even SDKs into your application layer. And heaven help you, if you are doing complex transformations like this guy is, we need something better. And this is where, in our opinion, GraphQL really shines. GraphQL is hot but for all the wrong reasons. Most proponents will argue that it increases the speed to market of an API client application, such as single page apps or mobile apps, and to a point that is true until you dig a little bit deeper into the paradigm. The key issue with GraphQL as an externally focused interface is that it exposes you to a few risks. You cannot easily predict the paths a query will take. You need to worry about deeply nested queries that could potentially cause a denial of service attack. You need to worry about accidentally exposing data that you really don't want to. And securing GraphQL is still an open subject, though, by the way, Tyke does a great job of it. All the freedom of getting what you want, when you want, how you want, also means exposing all the options to do so to a client app. And here's the kicker. It's a single page app that you do not control. But let's take a step back here. <clears throat> I said that GraphQL shines when considered in the internal API or integration context. Why is that? Well, GraphQL is a structured query language that gives you what you want, when you want, and how you want it. If all of your internal services were GraphQL and you wrote resolvers for all of your 137 third-party SaaS APIs, then you could theoretically query any data in your stack with a single query language and get a normalized response back. This is not dissimilar to our example earlier of writing intermediary services. What I am proposing is that GraphQL should really be considered as an extremely powerful integration language layer because it has all of the hallmarks we need. It normalizes data for the request to JSON, specifically, uh, sorry, specified by the GraphQL schema, which is strongly typed. Mediation happens in the resolver. It provides a standard interface to interact with multiple services and so normalizes the client code significantly. It can handle, but does not rely on message queues and real-time event subscriptions, making this an optional component that can still deliver message-based or active pipelines. And with good resolvers, it is possible to stitch data together between schemas and therefore create a single graph for the entire service and dependency stack. Huzzah! Well, theoretically, if you built your API's graph first, then you could create an enterprise-wide data plane that can be queried by any developer for any imaginable integration requirement. In the world of microservices, Lambda functions, and service meshes, having a standardized interface to all of your data means mediating operations between applications suddenly becomes extremely easy. No more proprietary connectors, less concerns around compatibility and upgrades for those systems, no more reliance on a, on a message bus and its associated architecture, a self-describing, discoverable, unified query language for all of your data, a new focus on function, not data, and faster dependency consumption, and so a faster time to market. This really is APIs all the way down. But wait, before the angry comments start flowing, 
I did gloss over a few things. And there are still some real problems to solve with this idea. GraphQL, as it stands now, is only suitable if used in a greenfield context. So only new applications. So you can write your service in GraphQL first and not need to write middleware resolvers for your existing REST or gRPC service stack. You don't want APIs on APIs. And ideally, it's only really useful if your SaaS service providers themselves provide a GraphQL API. Otherwise, you need to write a specific resolver for them and maintain it. And we're back to the same problem we had with our API gateway bus. Last but not least, in the end, in order to perform some integrations, you'll still need to write new logic and services to handle complex edge cases. So maybe we haven't quite reached an API-first integration panacea yet. To round off, we at Tyke are spending a lot of time on this problem, hence me speaking to you today. You see, we're pretty convinced that APIs are the integration paradigm of the future and that GraphQL is a fertile ground to plant the seeds of a new way of thinking about service integration. You see, if you could achieve a GraphQL data layer to handle your integration and plug in all of your external and internal data sources, having a single query language for all of your company's data is insanely powerful. So we've spent the last two years trying to make that a reality. We call it the universal data graph, and we've developed an engine that enables you to do exactly what I've described here without having to write new resolvers or code at all, because we do that for you. Now, I'm not allowed to show product up here. If you want to find out more about how we do this black magic, get in touch with us at the booth. Instead, I want to say this. Modern enterprises that are trying to liberate their data silos with their microservice stack should take a close look at GraphQL as an equalizer. I firmly believe that there is a significant future ahead for GraphQL, not as a consumer-facing API paradigm, but one that offers incredible opportunity for a discoverable, easy to use, highly visible integration platform that, more importantly, is intrinsically compatible with the API first reality that we find ourselves in today. And that's all I got. Thanks for listening. I hope the talk was useful and I look forward to questions and speaking to you guys, some of you guys after the talk. All right. Martin, thank, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, the question we have for you is that, you know, you are in this fascinating space of writing API gateways. So, you, you know, your business is not exactly building web apps and stuff. And so we were curious if you could get us, for instance, in your experience, some numbers from your experience. For instance, how many SOAP services are you still seeing around? Or how many people are, are still, um, you know, are, are building APIs in an hypermedia way using REST properly? You know, what, what's the situation of the, of this space right now. So in terms of SOAP APIs, you actually still see quite a lot of them around. There's still a lot of mediation where we're trying to, where we're brought in to help either connect to SOAP-based APIs that are legacy. Um, I don't think anybody's building them anymore. Um, nobody's really building new SOAP APIs. I think it's more about the services they provide and the systems that they've always uh, already integrated into. So something they've already bought um, that offers a SOAP API because that was the paradigm at the time. Um, in terms of more modern API ecosystems, we see a lot of um, the, the kind of growth was, yeah, we had hypermedia microservices that didn't work out. Lots of gRPC, sort of that's the standard now, and GraphQL is gaining real steam. So it's, it's, a, it's a good sort of mix between the three. Uh, the kind of um, the pattern we've seen is that for microservices, east-west sort of uh, traffic, we're looking at gRPC or binary style mm -hmm. protocols. But for north-south, people are still looking at RESTful APIs because they're just much easier to consume for developers. So there is also a mediation layer between getting things into and out of the microservice layer to make a better right. developer experience um, because gRPC is quite a lot to stand up for somebody who's just trying to write a small app. All right. All right. We have another question here. And uh, I don't know if we have time to answer, but let's try that. Uh, again, by building an API gateway, all the customers you have, what was the most worst weirdest scenario that you've seen that you were like, what happened here? Like, what happened? <laughs> oh, the horror story. Um, not so many, actually. I mean, it's only it's only sometimes we get those marvelous quotes where somebody's asking for something insane like that. Um, we do get some, some rather uh, spectacular requirements when we have to do uh, migrations between services, where we have to implement something, uh, migration between, let's say, legacy providers and um, sort of a more modern stack like ours, and where we have to write a lot of code just to you know make that legacy transition work. 
which is horrifying. Um, we did it with one of our customers and <laughs> they had uh, a hashing algorithm built into their authentication layer, which was completely custom. And mm -hmm. the people that we were talking to, well, the people we were taking them from, uh, they use sort of a mesh of computers to calculate this hash because it had a 10 second time window on either side. So there's a lot of hashes. You had to handle that skew and we had to do it in real time. So <laughs> we had to do it with the same latency requirements as well. And you just sort of think, why would we want to do that? It's insane. We, eventually, I mean, obviously you're going to drop that, but in order to keep everybody up and make sure the security is still in place, that was a bit insane to build because you're constantly oh, just optimizing your plugins. Um, yeah, they must be fascinated. I think probably in the code review, somebody was saying, what's going on here? And yeah, yeah. Like, that's exactly what should be happening. And don't ask me about it. Actually, one of my, my favorite ones was we used to have a client that was a, a newspaper publisher, a very big one. And they, um, they were transitioning all of their content URLs to HTTPS because that was the new thing. At the time, this was years ago. So everybody was trying to move to HTTPS. But instead of going to the database and actually just going and fixing the content because it's all embedded in the content, they wrote middleware at the gateway layer to run to in real time to, to regex the whole, every article, find every link and rewrite the HTTP, HTTP to HTTPS. Yeah. And they had to do that by coastally. So that was probably a bit insane having to support that. Um, thankfully, this, it didn't have one, to last long. This, this one is an odd one for me. So okay. you'll answer the question eventually. Okay. All right, Martin. It was a pleasure to have you. People, if you Thank have you any more questions, he's going to be hanging around in the, our successive events. Um, and you have a good rest of your day. Thanks a lot.